Rhonda Renee Johnson and Sharon Lynn Shaw were two teenage girls who disappeared in Harris County, Texas on the afternoon of August 4th, 1971. In early 1972, skeletal remains of both girls were discovered in and around Clear Lake near Galveston Bay. It's another one of those tragic cases where some innocent person had to pay with their life. However, we're dealing with two girlfriends that both got abducted and killed by the same person. On Wednesday, August 4th, 1971, Rhonda Johnson and Sharon Shaw, both of Webster, Texas, spent the day on a beach in Galveston, on Galveston Bay, approximately one week before Sharon's 14th birthday. The girls were seen leaving the beach, but did not return home. Eyewitnesses reported lost seeing the girls walking on Seawall Boulevard in Galveston. On January 3rd, 1972, two boys fishing in Clear Lake discovered a human skull floating in the water which they had initially believed to be a sports ball. Six weeks later, searchers discovered the rest of the body, along with that of another girl, in a marsh near the lake. According to a coroner's inquest, filed on February 17, 1972, the skull found in the lake was determined via dental records to have belonged to Sharon. Additionally, a crucifix found wrapped around the jawbone of the skull was identified by Shaw's mother to have belonged to her daughter. The other body in the marsh was positively identified as Rhonda. In May 1972, a tip was received from Glenn Price, a city councilman, to look into Michael Lloyd Self, a gas station attendant and sex offender in Galveston. Police visited Self at his workplace and he voluntarily went to the police station the following day for questioning. When shown photos of Shaw and Johnson, Self admitted to recognizing the girls but stated that he did not know them. According to him, Chief Michael Morris held him in confinement for hours, remarking that he would not leave until he had made a confession. Self also stated he was held against a wall, hit with a nightstick, and taunted by Morris with his pistol, threatening to kill him if he did not confess. He eventually agreed to confess and was forced by Morris to handwrite a confession to the murders of Shaw and Johnson. Morris allegedly forced Self to rewrite the confession several times. Dave Coburn, a local investigator, corroborated Self's story by claiming to have witnessed Morse treat a prisoner exactly the same way a year prior. The final signed confession by Self contained notable discrepancies. In the confession, Self stated he had dumped Shaw and Johnson's bodies in El Largo, which was over 20 miles from the marsh where police discovered the remains. He also wrote in his confession that he strangled both girls to death though reports from the medical examiner showed no evidence of strangulation. Three days after its confession on June 23, 1972, he provided further details to police in an oral confession that conflicted with his initial writing confession. In an interview with Deputy Sheriff W.A. Turner and Deputy Sheriff Frank Beamer, Self claimed that he had picked up Shaw and Johnson from a Sizzler Steakhouse and that the two had driven around the El Largo neighborhood and gotten food from a local jack-in-the-box restaurant. According to Beamer, Self claimed to have pulled over in a secluded area and struck the girls over their head with a Coca-Cola bottle and that he had stripped their clothes and thrown them on the highway. This conflicted with the fact that the girls' clothing was discovered with their remains. He then claimed to have thrown the girls' bodies in culvert on Choke Road. Two weeks later, sheriff's deputies checked Self out of jail and drove him to the various locations mentioned in his confession and photographed him at each of the locations. This would later be presented in court, though Self's attorney claimed the taking of the photos was illegal. His trial began on September 18, 1974, concluding on May 15, 1973, in which Self was charged with the first-degree murder of Sharon and sentenced to life imprisonment. He was not convicted of Johnson's. On October 9, 1974, Appeal of the case was denied. Three years later, in 1976, Chief Don Morris and Deputy Tommy Deal, both of whom had worked on Self's case, were arrested and charged with multiple bank robberies dating back to 1972. Morris was sentenced to 55 years in prison and Deal was sentenced to 30. Michael Self was denied parole numerous times and unsuccessfully appealed his conviction over the course of his sentence. In a September 22, 1992 written petition for appeal, 
reference to coercion in his confession was made. The district court acknowledged that the state court had twice found that no force or threats were used against Self to obtain his June 9th confession. Nevertheless, it found that the confession was so obtained and not freely given, despite Miranda warnings having been given. This finding is influenced by its earlier unwarranted illegal arrest ruling, as well as by credibility choices contrary to those made by the state trial judge, who had an opportunity to observe the witness's demeanor and whose province included weighing conflicting testimony. Self was refused a new trial by the US Supreme Court in 1993, having exhausted his appeals. He died in prison of cancer in 2000. In 2011, the Houston Chronicle published an article in which Self's attorney stated their belief that Self was wrongly accused and coerced into making a false confession. The article also noted two investigators, a Galveston police officer and a former Harris County prosecutor who also believed Self had been wrongly convicted. So even though we're dealing with two young girls that had to pay with their lives by some sick guy out there, it is a pretty bizarre turn of events to realize that this man was potentially coerced into making a confession. If some people clearly knew about how some of these officers handled other cases with other convicts, then it might not be so surprising that he may have been innocent in this case, even though he was a sex offender, so he clearly wasn't an innocent guy in general. But this makes the whole situation extra weird, because now we're just assuming that he was the person who killed these two girls, but what if he was innocent? That means the person responsible is potentially still alive and out there roaming the streets, which is absolutely messed up. Someone potentially getting away with murdering two young girls. Very, very tragic. I hope these girls are resting in peace. And if this man really was innocent, then I'm sorry for him being locked up without a proper reason. But at the same time, we can't rule out that he wasn't involved. I guess it's a giant mystery after all. As always, dear viewer, have sweet dreams.